Okay. <laughs> are we are we ready? Okay. Okay. I'm sorry. You all know I'm not just up here talking. It's actually a tech thing. I have to. I have to. I'm not just. You know. <laughs> what are you doing? Yeah. So where it's a Montezuma and uh Montezuma was is uh for us for the people who wanted to put the, the, the exhibit together, he was a misunderstood kind of James Dean kind of guy. <laughs> you know, they said he said that they said that he let Fernando Cortez just walk right into his uh his you know, his town and let him take over. And then Hernando Cortez wrote this, uh, you know, blockbuster Western novel about how he, you know, <laughs> came and conquered the whole uh, Americas, right? Yeah. And it was a bestseller, you know, in all of Europe for many generations. And uh, Mel Gibson directed the movie version of it, too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There you go. Yeah. Well, I'll leave you with that. I'll let the microphone drop. All right, okay. Yeah. And thank you. I, I never heard uh, Moctezuma uh, compared to James Dean, Louis. I fucking love that. <laughs> All right, Louis. Everyone, everyone go to La Reina Bakery and eat pan dulce from Louis. That's right. That's right. All right. Are we ready? Uh, I'm speaking again. This is, oh, I am ready. Okay. Hey, hola, everybody. Hello, hello. Buenas noches. Uh, I want to welcome you to the, uh, this is technically the inaugural event for Medicine for Nightmares. This is, uh, yes. Uh, for those of you that don't know, uh, we, me, uh, J.K. Fowler from Nomadic Press and the one and only Tan Kan Kao over there at the counter, we, uh, we're the new owners of this book space, this bookstore, which we hope to make even more of a, a community space for not only the Mission neighborhood, but also for our interconnected family and community out there. So uh, it's the second week that we've been open, and this is very exciting. And, and Steve brought this opportunity to us for the Poetry Center to have this amazing reading with uh, Wang Ping and Ava Kubor, uh, which is beautiful having you both here. Gracias so much. Um, it really means a lot, because for us, poetry is a lot of uh, the foundation of, uh, of who we are here. So having you all read here tonight is, is very special. So I want to say welcome to both you and uh, welcome to everyone. Please, please keep coming back because we're here. We're not going anywhere. And, 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 and the, the rumors are true. The, uh, the, the title of the store comes from a Sun Ra song. So we'll just put that in. And without further ado, give it up for the one and only Steve, Steve Dickinson. Yeah, I can't tell you how happy I am for this space and and the you know the recent changeover and you know in San Francisco we're so, so accustomed to the the menu of attrition something is chopped down and something else is chopped down and these people have to leave and those people are no longer around the corner and you know every now and then something happens where it's in the other direction a little bit and this one feels really good I've known Ton for years. I've met JK and um, Josiah more recently, and I just did you know, wonderful, wonderful people, and um, bringing a whole new spirit to this place and this part of the city. And um, we all need it, you know? So very, very happy and pleased to be here tonight. Um, there's a little history to this event. Um, let's see how far back. 2000, the year 2000, I invited Wang Ping to read at the Poetry Center, and she came out. She was already in Minneapolis at the time. Or was it St. Paul? I guess it was St. Paul. Yes. And she came out with her baby, who is now like in rock bands and, you know, whatever he's doing, you know. And um, the, uh, and and then I felt like 20 years is long enough. Let's get Wang Ping back from St. Paul. And we had. Um, lunch this summer in June when I passed through Minnesota. And, and then, um, so I set up a reading for November 11th, 
and Jennifer Chang agreed to read with Wang Ping. Last Thursday, my students say, how are we supposed to come to this reading if the school is closed? And I said, what do you mean the school is closed? Why didn't you tell me this like six weeks ago, you know? And so we had to do a lot of shuffling. And Jennifer Chang, I have to apologize. She has a child and she could not make the evening time. And so um, Ava Kubor was kind enough on very short notice to agree to read with us. And so I'm going to introduce Ava. You know, and Ava's a poet, visual, and sound artist. Her poems have appeared in various publications, two chapbooks. One is called Triangle Squared from Bootstrap. The other is Sinusoidal Forms from Lou Gallery. And then this recent full-length collection, which is up there, um, it's called Death Under Construction. It came out combined publication by Ugly Duckling Press in Brooklyn and Bird and Beckett here in Glen Park. Um, her latest electronic music performance was broadcast online in the Modular World Anniversary Series. If you go to our website or Ava's website, you can get a link right into that performance, and it's worth it. There's a whole bunch of people playing, but the link is right to her performance, and it's beautiful. Her latest assemblage is Eye of Noir. There's also a link for that. Hosted by Coulter Jacobson, were exhibited at Right Window Gallery down the street. On Valencia, she believes that each artist is a medium to transfer the world of possibilities to what is. We're all really, um, I'm really happy to know that Ava's now pursuing an MFA in electronic music and um, recording media at Mills College, and she just came directly from a class there. So we were asking, can you bring music? But the, there was not enough time in between the, the moves. So please welcome Ava Kubor. Hi, everybody. Uh, <laughs> my name is Alva Kubor. I'm excited that uh, this is the first, probably, personal reading from uh, two years ago. And thanks, Steve, for inviting me. Thanks, uh, uh, Wang Ping, and uh, everybody who's here or watching at home. So this book that is it's funny because his name is Death on, uh, its title is Death Under Construction, and his right came before, just uh, before the pandemic, it came out. So I didn't mean to really mean it. And just funny because when it came out, I was in Iran, and it was a, exactly at the time that they assassinated Qasem Soleimani. I was visiting my parents and also just kind of like, and Patrick, my husband, sending me the photos of my book. He was excited about it. And then all the flights canceled because <laughs> of the whole crisis. It was just a mess. And I came here, and pandemic happened. So I'm reading <clears throat> from my book that is just a combination of like a, a memoir and also uh, poems. A quantum momentum. On the brink of a sky so dark, sitting on an unknown star, casting about for light with a flashlight, opens the door to a galaxy of mirage. Darkness, whiffs of light, papava redness, Disguised agony, hysteric burst of blue, tears rain down. I'm thinking of the land, lonely sand of the coastline, waves join to the ocean's singularity. At the end of the road squats a tree waiting on the sun to throw shadows down a strange road. Perhaps the journey 
shortens after all. Caravan, visible and distant horizon. But this is no Sahara. Perhaps water is dreaming. Leaping into ocean, sand bedevils, all struck of the coast, myth making journey. Play though days, my hands estranged from creation, in displaced pride, widely swaying, touch unable to sniff out, uh, sniff out. I haven't brought even a bit of my reading here to this handcrafted tranquility. Where were you, Con conducting the city's strangers, sighing ah, while I'm here in a trap of image, prostrating myself in front of a tree? It's not binary, 50 times reincarnated each time, lived for 60 years, at 50 years old, acting as if he's 10 for five decades, 50, 60, 10, five, drowned in our genetic numbers, multiplying multifaceted unity, like an ovulatory evolution, series of eaves in clustered womb of eternity, neither muscular nor masculine, but alloyed fusion of chain hormonal reactions. From Tushul and Yushut to Ni and Naf, global space tends to zero, quality with no equality, quantity greater than capacity, zero to zero power, non-negative positivity, radicals which become medians, the rule is do as the Romans do. What happens to the remainder stays with the reminder, assert, unknown to the root. Algebra conforms to fatalism and jab, dance by chance by cho choice through reduction at absurdum, Overpopulated mass in acute confusion, chronic agony, such a messed up conclusion. A sign for desire. I need, I need, I need. I need, I need. I need, I. I need. To need a need. Need I to need a need? To need, I need a need. I need a need. A need. I need. I need. I need. Need a need a need. Need a need a need. Need me. A need. A need. A need. A need. A need. A need. A ni a a i da e da e d d n e i den i warning dead men walking I'm half Persian, half American now. I have watched so many zombie movies that I come to believe the apocalypse is a fact. Bunch of fit people running around in leather coats, samurai swords, stick fighting like kung fu master, feminist attackers with ninjas uniform, embracing full hijab, an apocalypse like a mixture of Halloween and Easter. Everybody in mask and costume, hunting for eggs and machine guns. 
an ap apocalypse depicting a future with green forest, laughter style sanctuaries, free lands, no rents, heroes and heroines with trendy haircuts and skinny jeans committing legitimate crimes. I'm so American now that I bought a ranger knife from Utah with which I peed I peel off my oranges with ease while watching the dead feeding off the living at the living beheading the head in order to leave. Zero against zero for John Cage. Tell me about writing hierarchy among words, larynx and tongue formed by sounds prior to speech. Sounds universal, laughter, water, crickets, roosters at time of salad. That happens after sound collides with culture, borders, scriptures, religious, and other. I mean, wherever sound arrived, lettered, Mob rule, first out meaning, and the results bring war and death. I want to write a white book full of silent pages. You may laugh at me, but say nothing. Let this story end as it becomes. And I'll read two more and then done. Forced migration. I am a rejected dream in depths of celestial chaos. You hear me as erratic air blowing between broken branches during blustery autumnal wind. I am unshaken royalty of imagination, full of foolish ideas. A monarchy fell from faint leaves of belief into darkness of Yalda's night. I am morbid sonority of a sorrowed silence gloating over its unstruck bow broadcasting the primal sound of the modern noise. I am in audible decibel of hearsay's hiss. I am the disappointed Mikhail, a fallen angel in favor of fast food ghettos, a go-getter in the Mahabharata war. I am an almighty Enoch, mine bona fide wives in a harem. I am a rusty, hungry stomach, grumbling in a rubato pace. I am a gypsy refugee, stamping in muddy Hungarian dance. I am a hobo grasshopper, crisscrossing from seashores to many banks. I have forgotten turquoise, mosaic mask, residing under damp doom domes of a blurry exile. I am a blogger, a reporter, a performer, three musketeers in a triad epic, scribbling down the tragedies in wild, wild Western style. I am a rejected dream in mystical hex of La La Land. Nobody needs build a crow's nest around the castles I built in the air. Mask face militia have already signed the orders to downting the witched clowns. Anyone more? Lament of the broken gramophone. My pain is not heaven's pain, eternity's pain. 
the Big Bang's pain, creationism's pain. My pain is earthly pain, flared up of missiles, whistling wine, only buried sub spring relief. My pain is the war's turnable needle getting stuck in cracks of power. A cacophonous racket boxing about my ears. Okay, thank you. I'll leave them up here. You can try them on. Thank you, Ava. It was wonderful. And um, now I'll introduce Wang Ping, um, a poet, novelist, artist. Wang Ping was born in 1957 in Shanghai, China. She earned a BA in English from Beijing University before immigrating to the United States in 1985. And I think I, you know, it didn't take long before I was catching wind of Wang Ping's activities around the Poetry Project and, um, you know, translations that were starting to happen and new work. Ping earned an MA in English from Long Island University and a PhD in Comparative Literature from New York University. She's the author of over 12 books, Poetry, Prose, and Translation, most recently, the poetry collection, My Name is Immigrant from Hanging Loose, and the memoir, Life of Miracles Along the Yangtze and Mississippi from the University of Georgia, which won the AWP Creative Nonfiction Award. Wong's work is deeply rooted in her Chinese ancestry and identity and addresses the complexities of language, culture, and gender. She has also been featured in several multimedia solo exhibitions, including We Are Water, Kinship of Rivers, a one-month exhibition that brought 100 artists from the Yangtze and Mississippi rivers to celebrate water and collaborated with filmmakers and composers on multiple projects, Minnesota Poet Laureate for 2021, 2023. So that's now. Yes. Is that why you're here? <laughs> <laughs> represent, you gotta represent. Wong is the founder of the Kinship of Rivers Project at McAllister College where she taught creative writing, as professor of English for 21 years, and is now a professor emerita. Let's welcome Wang Ping. Thank you so much. Oh, you're welcome. You're welcome. Thank you. Yeah, okay. Yeah, okay. Which one? This one? This one? So I can just take this off? This is not my intestine, though. <laughs> um, Chinese, in Chinese, we, uh, we, we equal food and poetry. It's the same one. I actually even designed the class. It's called Food and Poetry. And I took my students to do the four-day camping trip on the uh, Native American uh, reservation. And uh, so we did the wild. Oh wild rice harvesting, spear fishing, and sweating, and some hunting. And uh, so because of that, when we write and read poetry, we actually really just we're chewing the words. And since we enter the restaurant, if we're eating, we take off mask. So may I take my mask? Thank you. <laughs> so you just visualize I'm actually eating. My words. Thank you. Um, I hope it's okay with the bookstore. Okay, thank you. I am a medical doctor. Uh, I spent nine years studying Chinese medicine and Western medicine, so I actually don't need insurance. I'm my own doctor. And, and my, yeah, I have no insurance for two years, and my doctor 
checked my everything. He said, I've never seen anyone so healthy like you, and you have zero chance for heart stroke, for heart attack or stroke. So, and it says a lot um, about what's going on <laughs> in our house, in our uh, house field, whatever it is. And uh, I do spend a lot of money. I, I grow my own food. Uh, I practice zero waste. I drive an electric car and uh, use sun solar panels and uh, make my own food. And, uh, and I'm having a lot of fun with my body and mind. So I'm sure who is here actually uh, do probably a lot of similar things. And uh, so today I'm going to read some poems uh, from this book, then um, some new poems from my next manuscript. Uh, it's called uh, The River in Our Blood. And uh, also I want to start with a poem written by a Canadian physician, um, John McCrae. And he wrote this poem called In Flanders Field. Uh, which became, because of this poem, we, uh, there's a Veterans Day. And this poem is actually a prey for peace, no more wars after the World War II, uh, one, okay? And I spent days translating this poem into Chinese. And today's Veterans Day is also Veterans Day marked the end of the First World War I. And it's, it's also a kind of irony. It's an interesting fact that 11, 11, November 11th in Chinese, 1, 1, 1, 1. So it's a, like, it's a Chinese, we mark it as a bachelor's day because of the bare legs and you have no company, you're alone, just bachelor. Okay, so, <laughs> so, <laughs> so it became a, like a joke and a fun holiday for all bachelors. They would, yeah, Alibaba would like create a lot of like joke presents for bachelors. So. <laughs> yeah, but I will start with um, Chinese actually really like to have a lot of fun actually. And uh, if you ever have a chance to go to China, you will not realize how much we like to laugh. Okay, and uh, so I will start with the Chinese translation, then I will read the English. 在佛兰德的田野里，在佛兰德的田野里，罂粟摇摆，夹在十字间，一排接着一排，标明我们的家。天空里，百灵鸟勇敢的歌唱，好像听不见下面的枪响。我们死了，几天前我们还活着，感受
And they really thrive in the battlefields because those plants, they love the blood. And, um, and since this poem, the poppy flower became the symbol, uh, the veterans for war and peace for soldiers, for dead soldiers. Next poem I will read from this book. It's called Immigrants Can't Write Poetry. Um, this is one of my earliest poems when um, everyone told me that as an immigrant, I have no grammar and uh, I may be able to write a story, prose, but not a poem. So. I argued with a poet, I remember in the Cloister Cafe in New York, and at the table I wrote down this poem. She walked to mountain, she walks to a mountain. She walked to mountain now. She is walking to a mountain now. What difference it make? What difference does it make? In nature, no completeness, no sentence really complete thought. In nature, no completeness, no sentence really complete thought. Language, our birthright and curse, pay no mind to immigrant syntax. Poetry, born as beast, move best when free undressed. Actually, it's dedicated to Helen Vanderler, who's the Harvard uh, poetry critic. And her daughter-in-law happened to be my classmate from Beijing University. And she told me one day um, that uh, she has been writing poetry in Chinese. And one day she told her mother-in-law, Helen, she wants to write poetry uh, in English. And the mother said, mm, you have no grammar, probably not. So I actually kind of dedicated this poem to her, to Helen Vanderer. So, and the next poem I will read from this book, um, actually, um, I wrote this poem for this boy, uh, the Syrian boy who was washed up to the beach. And I wrote this poem, then I sent it to uh, Paul, and he used it for his magazine right away. And, uh, and then the Poetry uh, Magazine and the Poetry Academy adopted this poem on their website. Since then, this poem has been turned into many movies and children books and uh, set to music for choral, chorus music. So I will read this. Thank you for adopting that poem. Yeah. yeah. Things We Carry on the Sea. We carry tears in our eyes. Goodbye, father. Goodbye, mother. We carry soil in small bags. May home never fade from our hearts. We carry names, stories, memories of our village, our civilization. We carry scars from proxy wars of greed. We carry carnage of mining, droughts, floods, genocides. We carry dust of our families, incinerated in mushroom clouds. We carry our islands sinking under the sea. We carry our hands, feet, bones, hearts, and best minds to start a new life. We carry diplomas, medicine, engineer, nurse, education, math, poetry, even if they may mean nothing on the other shore. We carry railroads, plantations, laundromats, taco trucks, farms, factories, nursing homes, hospitals, schools, temples, built on our ancestors' backs. We carry old homes along the spine, new dreams in our chests. We carry yesterday, today, and tomorrow. We're orphans of the wars forced upon us. We're refugees of the sea, drowning in plastic wastes. We came from the same mother in Africa, we are your children, sisters and brothers, father and mother. Our tongues carry the same weight as we chant. 
I, Hub, Lib, Amor, Love, Ping An, Salam, Shalom, Pass, Peace, Xi Wang, Amal, Hafnan, Esperanza, Hope, Hope, Hope. As we drift, drift from dream to dream, see to see. And I'll read something um, a bit more fun. Um, there's a Egyptian poet, a poet from Egypt. Yes, thank you, Tony. Right? Yeah. So um, I love the form of Hazal, and how do you say it? You say Gazo, yeah, and um, I try to learn the word, how to say the word from different people, <laughs> different pronunciation. So it's called Biography of Green, an edible sonnet hazal. I like to combine sonnet and hazal. With fiddle hands, I fold and unfold light, painting air with emerald green turning CO2 into sugar plus O till I drape the earth with 24 shades of green. This planet was born in a ball of fire, then basalt, then granite, then glacial ice. With slate of hand, I pickled her into lime, sage, basil, pear, and apple green. I tap, clap, spin, whisper, sway with willows, my juniper veins open to the sun, my moss blood running towards roots, and life sings with parakeet green. Awakened from Arctic dreams, I chase grassland and forests with seaweed tendrils, a linchpin between sky and earth, my wavelands paints cypress with spruce mint green. Spectrum between blue and yellow, Rosetta stone from for fern, shamrock, sea foam, sitting amidst the rainbow wheel, I open seasons with chartreuse mustard green. Chinese make no difference between blue and green, but believe Qing Chu Yulan, Bi Shen Yulan. So let green equals crop, crop, uh, uh, chlorophyll, photosynthesis, O equals O equals glucose equals pear equals pine and ocean green. A cycle without beginning or end, my sapphire waves shimmering, lighting up first word. Smell, taste, sound, touch, till earth hangs on the trick of olive green. Count pollens on cypress, count clapping hands on aspen trees, count trees on earth. Behold earth in my palms of a 120 20 quadrillion leaves, a pantalasa of pistachio green. Green color is like really magic because it literally sits in the middle of the color wheel and it's and literally it's the color that produces life. And it has 24 shades of green and they're all associated with food, also life. So when I discovered that, I was just so delighted. So I wrote this poem. And uh, as a medical doctor, <laughs> um, I, uh, my, my main focus is on uh, the brain. And I found the brain is so interesting. And uh, uh, because I saw, like, I taught uh, poetry 21 years, and I noticed a lot of students were in so much pain. So my focus is also on pain. But I also realized like how we we do have the ability to transform pain into joy, right? And uh, through poetry. So 
and especially the the area of the brain. Uh, my focus is really hippocampus, the the seat of memory. So I wrote this poem. Hippocampus, seat of memories, for yesterday, today, and tomorrow. The only part of the brain that keeps growing or shrinking. It's a needle sewing the past and future together. A handful of threads weaving reality into silk brocade. Use it or lose it, says the neurologist. If we don't recall or reinvent our pain, love, joy, fear, anger, or sorrow, how do we keep our past? Without our past, how do we find humanity? Without humanity, how do we stand? And how the instance of now holds onto the future? Handsome H.M. lost his hippocampus to live a normal life, was tossed into the sea of present tense, drifting between now and here, hospital and lab tests, between happiness and sorrow. But where is the young, gentle Henry? Who is the good old M HM without a story? Homo sapien experts tell us the size of hippocampus is the key to, for memory, is the foundation for logic and emotions. Logic emotion allow us to plan our future is the hallmark that separates us from beasts. But how do we explain elephants carrying the biggest memory house for smell, sound, touch, and love? And chimps who play politics better than the baboons in the White House? and the crows who remember faces and know what to do with friends or enemies, monarchs who remember every milkweed to stay alive along its migration route. We think we know as priests, scientists, and conquerors, but do we know what we don't know? Do we hear Gaia's weeping for our misfortune? Do we see animals laughing from their kingdoms as they watch how we scheme our escape from this wheel of memories, how we untangle ourselves from this spoke of time and space. Magic. Birds sing because they have a song in their throats. Fish swim because they have an ocean in their bellies. The wind blows to play with the rivers and valleys. Raindrops fall as messengers upon the earth. We move with the dance in our spirits. Children run as the world unfolds under their feet. This is the secret of magic hidden in our brains. The people and their small things, if all taken away, what would we miss? The rustle of oak trees as dusk. at dusk, the foaming river outside the window, the smell of children coming home, cheeks red from the snow, the little things you say that's not funny, but I laugh anyway just because. The birds can't be imitated. The flowers cannot be colored. The sea can't be dammed. The mountains can't be conquered. This is the sound of magic running in our veins, moving the sky and earth, passing through us like rivers. All the noise on earth will die, but not this silence of faith, this innocence persisting to believe, to see more than what we can see. The third eye, another... <sighs> The third eye, it's mid-April, a blizzard arrives with hail and sounds of chimes. Robins have begun their flight to the north, following the smell of snow and rain, the thawing earth and the worm's vertical migration. On her 80th birthday, my mother asked if I would go home one more time. A brainstorm in soft simplicity. 
a debate if I should become a citizen after three decades of wandering in America. A friend sent me the third snow, a century old poem from Siberia. Blizzard is indifferent to space or time. Please don't go back home, pleads Gary Snyder, tears in his eyes. You know you are on their list, right? Via WeChat, my brother marvels at my home in St. Paul, how affordable compared to his six million yuan hole on the island. He is willing to forego the breeze from East China Sea for a place in Minnesota freeze. Yesterday, I rode 15 k kilometers in my single skull. Today, the Mississippi moans again under ice. Yet robins know how to wait. They know when spring rides the cold front, when worms awaken the earth. They follow the 37th degree isotherm for their flight between Guatemala and Minnesota. I applied for citizenship twice, three times, but chickened out after I did my fingerprints. I never showed up for the swearing. For 35 years, my mother had tried to unlock the secret of Dao De Jing. She was allowed to step into the way only after she lost her sight at 73. I know I'm not on, I am on the list. I was arrested take, talking to immigrants in the village, now 178 meters under the, the dam, but I still can't cut my roots. When the blizzard blows robins off course, they fly towards the sun, following its angled light to get back on track. Two free radicals spin in their eyes under the blue light like two lovers, radiant with joy. This is their quantum coherence, our inner compass through each blizzard towards home. The last poem is this poem I wrote about 20 years ago, 2002. I took my two kids uh, to Israel, actually Golan Height, to dig uh, a temple, a Roman temple uh, with McAllister's uh, uh, team and uh, then afterwards, uh, we traveled around Israel, and uh, <sighs> things I saw and felt 20 years ago, um, it's been happening over and over again, and uh, my feeling hasn't ch changed. And uh, I had many quarrels with my ex, uh, who's, a who's a Jewish, uh, American Jew, and... Uh, Yeah, and we grew apart, and uh, my feeling about that place is still the same, so I wrote this poem called Jerusalem, Jerusalem. It's impossible to sink in the Dead Sea, almost. Slabs of stone reaching from tombs, witness to untold stories. We didn't plan this, but every morning, when the sun opened the sky with orange and blue, the boys began to climb up the steps through the Jaffa Gate, the empty alleys of shops, cafes, homes, through the X-ray machines and guards, jumping, sliding, trudging, singing towards the wall to press their faces against the stones in the praying sea. Nobody told them to. When the sun went down, their short chubby legs carried them back, singing, Moses came down from the mountaintop, a song they had learned at the nursery school in Minnesota. In the Turkish bazaar of Palestinian quarter, we haggled over a t-shirt that said, America, don't worry, Israel stands behind you. He haggled over a dollar, face red, eyes red, just give him a 
two dollars, I finally said, what's two bucks for you? Not enough for a cup of Americana. You don't know business. That's why you're poor. No haggling, no respect, no respect, no Israel. Bob wired hotels along the shore, patched camps beyond a dusty horizon, brown workers hidden in orchid, orchards, sparse bridges, sounds of prayer from armored compounds. Today's wind blows from Mount Olive, slicing dream after dream. Who bestows us with this? Who can tell how much is illusion? Isabel, the olive-skinned daughter of the Turkish bazaar, walked us through the maze of the old town. Her brother, a sixth grader, gave us oranges from his juice stand when his mom wasn't looking. He whispered his dream of getting out of the slum, of making a movie about his Portuguese father and Palestinian mother, his grandparents in the West Bank. But how could you understand this unless you speak Arabic? He mumbled, turning away. Isabel watched us in the sunset, smile receding from her brown eyes like a tide. The mud here is heavy and black. The water boils with the odor of rotten eggs. The sea has no exit. The, in the mist of sulfur magic, people converge, the sick and old, the rich and poor. They soak in the yellow spring, waiting for miracles. Jerusalem, where the land ends and begins, matchless, a path for the return of wailing hearts. Oh, regret comes only after the deed. The light of the plum blossom is gone, only a kindling flame to light her track. How easy to get tangled in the fire of thoughts. Who should laugh? Who should cry? Who should keep the land? Who must go? Who should be a master? Who a slave? Who could live? Who must die? This pain has no tongue. Standing on their father's shoulders, children folded their prayers into cranes, stuffed them into the highest cracks they could reach. A dove landed on the wall, cooling through the grass. Will, they, will she pick it out and eat it? asked the little one. Will she bring it up to heaven? For the sake of desire and fate, for tears turned into flame and cries stuff stifled. In smoke, dip the apple in honey. Dip hatred, blood, dip hope and despair. Dip remorse hidden in the gut. Dip children's cries and hopes to resettle in the cradle of roots. Dip Bethlehem, dip Jerusalem, dip bombs, tanks, checkpoints. Dip the world plowed with sorrow in the bowl of honey. The little ones stopped each stranger on the street. Please repeat our new password. Shalom, shalom, shalom. Thank you. Um, thank you, Ping. Thank you, Ava. I don't know if anybody has any questions for these two or anything. And, and they'd probably be welcome to respond if anybody has anything they'd like to ask, you know? Yeah? Anyone? Otherwise, it's just been really nice. It feels good in this space and really happy to be here and happy to, you know, it's an honor to, you know, honor to um, be able to have these people with us in this, in this, for this first event in the new Medicine for Nightmares. So many, many events to come. And so, yes, it's from a song by Sun Ra, 1956. Yeah, yeah, it was called Medicine for a Nightmare. 
Yeah, the song. And there are two versions, like I was looking it up the other night. There's one that came out as a single maybe after the other one. I don't know, but there are two. They, one opens with a trumpet and one opens with a, with a tenor saxophone. So I don't know, yeah. But it's a beautiful song, a beautiful title. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Because I think I think he wrote uh really well to learn another language other than English. Yeah. And I wonder if you um feel you it's easier to write poetry in your original language. Would you like to come up and pull yeah. it Yeah, can you use the mic? Can we get a ten minute break down for you? Pardon? Can we get like a a, a, a tiny break? Okay, yes, sure. Language and what are the challenges in writing it 
for you as an English historian? Yeah, the, the process is different. There are things that you can say, for example, in English you cannot say, if, you know, just like um, you're putting yourself in different, finding yourself in different situations when you write in different languages. Even your thinking process sometimes changes, but in terms of easier or not, I can say when, because I write in Farsi poems too, so in Farsi it's more uh, unconscious. Things coming together very natu more naturally than in English, sometimes I have to think, okay, I want to say, if you want to keep it, for example, in this form, uh, how can I do it? But in Farsi it's very natural and easy. So it's more consciously you do something in English. I don't know about language, but that's how. My challenge is, is more conscious versus Farsi that is unconscious. Well, it's a really great question. Um, uh, Chinese poetry in China, in Chinese, considered sacred. So it has already just like so much pressure. When you start writing poetry, you have to be perfect, right? And uh, so when I, I didn't dare to write poetry when I was in China, and I started writing poetry uh, when I was uh, doing the translation for Allen Ginsberg. From, uh, I was helping him to do, host the first uh, Chinese American Poetry Festival in America, that is 1988. And uh, I was doing a lot of translation. Then translation actually is the deepest reading and writing, right? And, uh, and also, in, you have to keep like coming and back and forth. You probably know, right? You're a translator. Who else is a translator here, right? And uh, uh, you constantly have to just travel between the two rivers and across the abyss. And it's a lot of fun. And um, so when I was doing, then I realized, oh, I can write this kind of poetry too. So I started you know, writing and uh, and then very soon, the Poetry Project from St. Mark's Church invited me to do my very first reading. And I only had like about 10 poems in, in Chinese and maybe like two poems in English. And I thought I need to like translate more poems from Chinese into English, right? And because I two or three poems in English is not enough. So I started translating, and pretty quickly I realized I can't, because I, I put the two poems, uh, the, my Chinese poetry and English poetry, next to each other. I just found like they're like two different animals. In Chinese, I was a good girl, right? And in English, I was a play girl. I was doing all kinds of somersault and breaking rules and just have so much fun, right? And that made me just suddenly I realized, oh, my mother tongue is actually a whip, right? And telling me to be a good girl all the time. And therefore I was very rigid and a very good citizen, law abiding citizen in Chinese poetry. So that's the moment I realized, all right, I'm going to focus more on in English, even though at that time, uh, a lot of my friends just like laughed at me, just saying like, no way you could. Actually, I was uh, engaged to um, a professor from McGill University, NBA, uh, uh, like in the business school. And he convinced me to take GMAT uh, without math. I, I never studied math, but I actually passed GMAT and I was accepted into uh, MBA at McGill University, and I was going to get married to that professor and became a businesswoman. And his reason is, with your second grade English, how could you get ever published? It would be more easy to actually enter paradise than getting published with your second grade English. And um, so, so I decided to burn my bridge, right? I did not go. You know, I already like moved everything to Canada, to Montreal, and I didn't board the train to Montreal, right? And I stayed in New York. Uh, I burned my bridge, and uh, I decided to just take my chance 
was my second grade English, you know. And uh, so a lot of things happened, and I survived. And uh, because I had only like eight months to uh, get my, uh, I had eight months left to, to, to uh, with my working permit to stay in New York. If I don't get a, a job and start processing the green card work permit, I will have to go back to China, right? And uh, but I did, and um, I got a job, and I got myself a green card within eight months, and uh, and now here I am, right? And so, but the main thing is poetry. What I want to say is, our mother tongue. The moment we were born, right, we already hearing the mother tongue, which is trying to already trying to mold us into this, like a logic thinking, the alphabet, right, especially the English language, and which is basically linear, right? With the English alphabet, it is from A to Z. You can't jump around too much. But with the Chinese language, actually, it is the ideogram. It's more like a Lego parts, right? And we can, you know, a Chinese word, sorry, we don't have. For example, the word bright, Ming, right, is made of the two basic parts, sun and moon. When the sun and moon together, we have light, we have bright, right? We have shine, right? And so, the Chinese, the basic parts, we can put them, like any word with the word sun has something to do with light, bright, right? And we can use the basic sun to make up with, to make with other words, right? And uh, so, and the Chinese words, you can write upside down, right, left to right, right to the left, it doesn't matter, because each word is its own unit, right? Its own kingdom. So that gives, Chinese poetry, a lot of freedom to play, right? And, uh, and I did not know that secret until much later through, actually through Ezra Pound's translation of, from Fanelosa, who's a Japanese uh, art history historian who lived in Japan all his life. Then when he died, his study notes of Chinese poetry um, from his Japanese teacher somehow wandered into the hand of Ezra Pound, and he wrote two books which changed the world of poetry from Europe, in Europe, and then the wave came here to America. And one book is Cathay, which is the translation of like about 20 Chinese poetry from the Book of Songs to Li Po and, by, uh, to Li po and Du Fu. Right, it's only about 20, very thin book. And the other is the, uh, it's called Chinese character as a media to poetry, right? And he, that is just opens my eyes, right? And uh, so made me realize how the mother tongue, the freedom, the unconsciousness that the mother tongue gave us, but at the same time, it's also the oil or the ready pass Right and uh, how we walk on the ready-made path without seeing, without thinking, just we do it by habit, right? And the poetry is anti-habit, right? If we want to write fresh, refreshing poetry, we must break that path. We must make our own new path, right? And what's the best way to write in another language? So, so I got this advantage. Even though my toys were so limited, just a few, right? My language, my words, right? I have only much, I have much fewer words, toys to play with, but because I cannot take any toy for granted, every word, I have to go to the roots to find its origin, original meaning and multiple meaning, and the layers of what's embedded in and around the word. So I got to play quite a bit. And here I am. So thank you. Hello? OK. So uh, this is for Professor uh, Wong Ping. Um, writing in 
multiple languages with an American readership that is um, mainly English speaking, how do you navigate and decide how much of uh, a language beyond English to hold in poetry? Um, because to some extent, uh, similarly, someone who writes in another language, it becomes private uh, with some parts of it. So I'm just wondering how you decide how much of another language to, to weave into your poetry. Thank you for the great question. Um, when I started writing, I was writing mostly poetry and stories. And especially for stories, I have lots of stories, basically. Lots of my stories and poetry actually is my conversation. I wanted to talk to my, my mother, but I can never do it in real person. So I tried to do it. But also, I could not do it in the Chinese language. So I wrote it in the sec in English, so she couldn't read it, right? <laughs> but mother always knows when I sent her my first book, and she wrote back to me like, "You are like I was so nice to you. <laughs> you know why are you saying bad things about me?" <laughs> so even though she didn't read English, but anyway, that probably answered because I have this advantage of telling something very private, right? But I could do it in English, so I wouldn't offend my mother, right? And we have this urge, right? Writing, we have to show our inner arts, basically, our visceral, our organs, right? And uh, we have to be very honest, right? Otherwise, the readers will just run away. They can smell we're faking it, right? We're not saying everything, right? Uh, they would just they just lose interest, right? And uh, so I feel like since I'm writing another language, I almost like I have no inhibition, you know? And uh, just like the way I learn language, uh, I, I became, in Chinese, I'm very timid, okay? And uh, when I speak Chinese, I'm always afraid of making mistakes and make a fool of myself in front of my Chinese people. But in English, I don't care because I'm supposed to make mistakes, right? And uh, so that really gives me a lot of advantage. And people laugh at me, and I laugh my, myself, but I learn, you know? And I learn a lot of like new ways, different ways, how to express myself, right? And uh, so I think probably people find it uh, kind of refreshing, but even though I find like a lot of Asian Americans, like, you know, they think I'm not quite grammatically correct, you know, and uh, they will frown upon my writing, but I don't care, you know. I have plenty of other people who find that my writing interesting. And um, as I, that's why I read the poem, Immigrants Can't Not Write Poetry, right? Because what is the writing? What is the ultimate goal of writing is not just like a decoration, but to convey, communicate our innermost feelings, right? And uh, ultimately, um, if, you, if I do make a few grammatical mistakes, but people can feel the vibration between words, but, like they can feel the story. And that's really the most important thing. Plus, if it becomes like editors like Paul, he will correct my grammar, right? And <laughs> so I don't care. And I learn every time. The true, learning, every, the true learning I make is actually from my errors. So it doesn't matter. I'm not afraid of mistakes. And the first thing when I teach for 20, almost 30 years, I also taught in New York, I told my students, I'm here to teach you how to make mistakes until you, how to fall, right? I have a black uh, belt in martial art. We practice how to fall with grace for one year before we can learn anything. So it should be the same in writing and poetry, how we make mistakes with graciousness and grace. Just kind 
of like how much you, you just like it, it. I think the context of a, what you're writing sometimes there are, yeah. Sometimes when you write in different languages or words that you can, you think that you cannot express it otherwise. So you are free to use it. It's just, there are, there are moments that there are, there, there are things that you, in, you write in, for example, I write in Farsi, but in English makes more sense. So I have to even borrow from English. So you become just kind of like in between zones and sometimes whatever resources you have, you use, whatever language. There are just expressions that in one language, there are things that the act, I, I think the pronunciation sometimes in a poem, they just kind of like if you write it in another, the same language, for example, if you say, for example, capitalism, capitalismus, it's just based on where, how do you want to use it. We can use, I think, other languages, borrow for the meaning, for the sound, even for the, how it fits in the context of a poem. Thank you. Uh, uh, I, I'm, I'm just wondering too, um, is there something akin to what Ping was saying about, I, I, I would think that in Farsi there must be also this sense of a kind of sacredness of poetry and, um, you know, like like all these great poets have, have written in the Persian language. And, you know, I don't know, is that is that something that factors into this, you know? I, I think it's part of a culture first. And then uh, the uh, one of the things just like, they say Farsi is a very poetic language. Even for example, Rumi could speak in Arabic and Turkish, all these languages, but he chose Farsi because he said that's a poem, a language of love. So it's very rhythmic, you can make different rhythms. And then growing up because of the past history of a classical poetry that is mostly Farsi uh, is known for, those, for example, we memorize it during the memorizing during the, for example, uh, during education, and then uh, it stays with you. So just every every wherever you go, even in a cab, taxi cab, in everywhere, people express their feelings with poems. I don't know sometimes because it's just like the history of Iran. There are so many different just attacks they had. So they use this language that it's not direct. With the poetry, you can just like, it seems that you're speaking with each other in secret. So I think it becomes a culture that you speak in poetry together. 